Hello to you, tabletop enthusiasts. I'm Celine, brand and community manager for Game on Tabletop, the crafting platform for gamers by gamers. I am back with a new video for our series where we interview different actors from the board game and the crafting industry. Today, I'm with Rory O'Connor from Up Games to talk about game design. Hello, Rory. How are you? I'm good, Celine, and really happy to be here. Um, you know, a nice sunny day in September in Northern Ireland. It's a rare treat. So first, can you tell me a bit about yourself, what you do and how you and your wife, Nita, started the Creativity Hub, now called Hub Games? I live in Belfast, Northern Ireland with three amazing teenage daughters. Um, I co-founded the Creativity Hub with my partner, Nita Murphy, um, initially to provide creativity training um, and facilitation. Um, so I have a background in conflict resolution, creative thinking and problem solving. Um, and as part of that, we developed um, a tool called Rory Story Cubes, which was a creative thinking tool. Um, it went on to be more than just a creative thinking tool, and we ended up building a whole business around that um, over the years, and eventually sold that in 2017 to transition into hub games, where we really wanted to create games that uh, we say surprise, delight, and challenge players. Um, so we create, we've got games like Holding On and Prison Marina, um, Untold Adventures Await and, and Blank. Um, so yeah, it's at my heart, kind of play is at the core of everything I do, trying to get people to play and see themselves and their world in a different way. For the people who might not know what the story cubes are, can you explain what it is and who they were originally meant for and how it led you to become a publisher? The Rory Story Cubes, I should have kept a set beside me. Um, so they're a set of nine cubes, uh, like dice, with a unique icon on each side of them. And the idea is that you roll all nine cubes, you're going to get one of over seven million possible kind of combinations of images. And the objective is to make a story that begins with Once Upon a Time and somehow links together all nine face-up images. Seems really simple, but there's a whole lot going on beneath the surface because of the way our brain works. We can't help but pattern match so we try to solve the puzzle of like what is the story here and our brain will you know throw out associations um so it's kind of it was originally about getting people to um again use their imagination get used to making creative connections and what happened was it started as a creative thinking tool but more and more um families were saying oh my children are using it for like story writing in school or you know therapists were saying, well, we're using it with our patients to help them kind of open up and tell their stories as well. And it, it literally took on a life of its own and kind of outgrew our idea of, I think I thought I'd sell maybe a thousand copies of Story Cubes back in 2004 or five to coaches around the world. Um, in 2017, at the point where we were selling the IP on to Asmodee, um, the publisher, um, we had sold, I think, just over 7 million units. And it's now like well over 8 million units. That's a really interesting concept. So it can pretty much be used in any creative field. For for gamers, it's, it's really popular with DMs. Scenario creation, describing what an NPC looks like, uh, creating events. Because if you say, I want to create an event, and you roll the icons, um, they act as like what people call in role-playing like an oracle. So it kind of gives you prompts to then kind of generate your own ideas. And that's really the heart of it is about getting you to pay attention to your own ideas. So a few years ago, you've developed Untold Adventure Awaits that needs the story cubes to play. So what are the lessons that you've learned with the development of this game? So that was interesting because that was um, <clears throat> happened at the time we were selling the IP for Rory Story Cubes and it was like our kind of our swan song. It was the last thing we were going to develop with Rory's Story Cubes. And we wanted to create um, essentially a, a my first role playing game experience for people uh, that could be played in 60 minutes um, and had no GM as part of it. Um, so we wanted it for people who'd never played a role playing game before. Um, so what we learned was one, setting really tight constraints was really helpful. You know, about that time duration was really help shape the game because we know role-playing games take can take a long time to play in one session um also we kind of said we have to annoy traditional role players um and the reason i say that is because 
a lot of people created like introductory role playing experiences, but to me, they were still adding in the problems that were at the heart of introducing people to role playing games, which is like character creation and heavy rules that you needed to learn. And so I kind of said, okay, I distilled down what is the experience I want players to have. And I think there was three things. It's like, they want, I wanted their choices to matter. I wanted the world to react in response to what they were doing. And I wanted them to work towards an ending, but not sure, be sure how they were going to get there. And that essentially became the kind of cornerstones for Untold. And they, and they kept us really focused. Um, but it also meant throwing out things like char- you know, character creation being the first thing you did. We actually do it like after the first scene when you have a better idea of what character you want to be rather than trying to do it beforehand. And that was our first crowdfunding project as well. That was for us really about building an audience um, coming from Rory Story Cubes, which was quite different um, in terms of the audience for that versus something like Untold. And we did realize, I guess, with you know crowdfunding platforms, there's definitely, I think in gaming, there's a particular kind of audience that uses it as well. And sometimes the decision you know, that we make is like, we're not going to go to crowdfunding because it's not the right audience for our game as well. So yeah, I think we learned that along the way as well. In another interview, you've talked about the storytelling and the cost of bigger games like Gloomhaven, for instance. Um, where do you think the balance is in the industry between bigger, more complex and more expensive games? versus the opposite, and how do you think this will develop in the future? Well, like, sort of personally, I love playing, I enjoy playing big games. Um, I think as one, I get older, I have less time with children, so I become more aware of the value of smaller games. I mean, I think there's room for everything. Um, I think my focus is on bringing new people into gaming, and I think as part of that, um, games that are easier to get into and don't seem daunting um, are really helpful for that um, because I think rule reading is one of the biggest barriers to getting people into playing games. I guess I think a lot about the kind of economic background of the people who are playing games and playing our games and so in particular for us we try to think who's our audience and what can they, what do we think they can afford for this game? And I think it's more for people to think that those big box games are not the be all and end all of what you have to create as a designer. Do you think that designers should develop some sort of checklist for themselves when it comes to designing games? I'm really bad with checklists. I think I do have a couple of things like internal that I've internalized. And a big part for me is about thinking about the player and their experience. That's, you know, one of my main checklists. Um, I think thinking about how the game is going to be made. So again, the affordability. So it makes me think about the, the components. I'm creating a kind of a strong visual experience. Um, I think for me personally, I also want to create games that, like I said, kind of challenge, delight and surprise. And I guess that's my checklist, you know, when I'm designing something. I kind of drive some of my team mad because I'm not probably as um, structured as they would like me to be one of my key things is to kind of find I try to find where the like the enjoyment is in the game and then like amplify that up as much as possible like just go full on into how do you really bring that out for for players I think you said in another interview that you do not see yourself as a designer but as a change agent so how can um, creators implement this um, to make their ideas stand out more in a very buzzy market well I guess to put it in in First of all, in, in, in context, yeah. since I left college, I literally kind of ran away to join the circus in terms of a community arts group. So I was seeing the impact of community arts on, uh, you know, small villages in the west of Ireland. Um, I was later involved in cross co- community conflict work you know, up here in, in Belfast in Northern Ireland, using filmmaking as a way of bringing teenagers from Catholic and Protestant backgrounds together. That was Rory O'Connor. I was like a facilitator. Um, and I created a creative thinking tool called the Inner Vision Deck. Years ago, it was like my kind of first creative thinking tool. And like I said, uh, Rory Stray Cubes was like another creative thinking tool. So I never came into this thinking I was a game designer. I just happened to have created something that worked. 
and the really interesting thing was like a lot of people around would have said that'll never work because I wasn't fitting the mold of what a game was expected to be in terms of the the box size, the price. You don't win in this game. They were like, what? <laughs> you know, you know, and it's funny because it's kind of around the time of pandemic as well. You know, which really uh, kind of set the bar as a as a co-op experience. This was like a kind of a, a non-competitive experience. Coming at it from being a change agent perspective, you kind of know you have to be, you have to kind of push up against the norms of what is considered the norms you might get pushback but that's also feedback so it's not to say that you shouldn't do something it's like oh but the way it's currently being done there's maybe a reason for that so what's that reason and how do we work around it we knew this game needed to exist there was, like there was something that we were seeing with Roy story keeps of people how people were playing with it we thought this thing needs to be out in the world because we were hearing back from people what it meant to them to play with that game. So whilst we received doubt from distributors and publishers, we were like, no, 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 we know this has an impact. Like, we know this makes a difference. But how do we convince you that it does? Because you're kind of like the gatekeepers into this. And so putting on our kind of change agent head or conflict resolution head, we were like, okay, what's their concerns? You know, and a lot of it was to do with trust and perception. So we took that and we actually redesigned the Story Cubes box to look like uh, a makeup box because it's a small product, but with a high value. And then suddenly people stopped thinking about it as being just the dice and being the, the bigger product. So I guess as being a change agent, it's you're coming at game design as saying, well, you know, how can I get people to think differently you know by playing how can i get them to think differently and doing it in a, in a playful way that people can have what i call like huh moments where they play the game and they go huh hmm, there's something more going on here than just entertainment in your game prisma arena you've combined different types of uh, target groups as it can be played by kids by themselves or only adults or adults and kids how do you keep both type of players engaged so i mean that was really the origins of that were quite funny because it came from a conversation with my co-designer, uh, John Fury, who I'd worked with on Untold. He was a huge fan of Story Cubes. He worked with us on Extraordinaire's design studio as well. And he was lamenting that he had all these hero clicks and he couldn't play them with anyone because the game had become too complex. So he wanted to create a rule set to use them. And I kind of went, oh, hang on a second. I'm going to set you a bigger challenge of something I want to achieve. And I said, it, so design a rule set that can be played by children with each other, with parents and children and two adults together as well. Um, and so that's what we set about doing. He came up with the kind of the core me mechanic for the game. Um, and the way we achieved it is we essentially layered elements within the game. So the game starts off quite straightforward, but as you play, you level up. So it's this concept of training. Um, and after like a few games, you've unlocked powers and that becomes like the norm at which you can play. Okay, so it's like the same rule for everyone, but if you're an adult, maybe you can start at the higher levels. It's interesting because a lot of adults say, oh, I'm just going to go and play like the higher level. Okay. And it's like, no, no, you're missing the point. <laughs> like, because the whole thing is you don't know which powers are good until you've played the game. So as you play it, that's when you recognize your play style and you go, oh, this would be really powerful. Because otherwise you look at things and think, oh, that's, you know, the, the kids around me, they go, that's broken. Or, you know, or that's useless, you know, and you, and it's un until you've played a few games, you go, oh, this thing that didn't look like it was really that useful is actually really handy because now I understand how the game works. Um, so yes, adults want to think they can jump in and play at a higher level, but they're really still better off playing, like leveling up their characters so they get a full understanding. Some of your games go directly to retail, while others are launching on crowdfunding campaigns. Do you know in advance where you will launch uh, a game? And does the decision to crowdfund allow you to make different design choices? I think traditionally for us um, with Roy Story Cubes, like we had distribution in 52 different countries around the world. So I think when we transitioned from the creativity hub to hub games so when we renamed the company um 
we were kind of working on the basis that we already had distributor relationships. So that was kind of like our first stop. Um, we did use crowdfunding for Untold Adventures Await as a way of saying kind of, hey, we're here and we're doing something different. Um, what was interesting is we realized that, you know, our Story Cubes fan base did not transition over to uh, Kickstarter. Um, it's a very different audience. And I think realistically as a company, we've kind of, um, it's been a challenge walking that line as to what we should, where we should go. Like I mentioned, uh, Prison Arena, we, we just, we were kind of planning to go to Kickstarter with it because we thought it was, it was doing something really innovative with stickers and, you know, kind of representation within the game because you could add stickers to your character to change both their kind of, uh, their identity and, and kind of gender. Um, and we thought this is, you know, people will get behind this on, on, on Kickstarter. And, um, when we went though, we, we kind of packaged it as not having stretch goals. We're saying like, this is the game, um, because of my conversation with price point earlier. Um, and I think, you know, luckily we had a big order from Asmodee. So we actually ended up pulling the Kickstarter because it didn't, it didn't take off. And I think, you know, the kind of feedback is, you know, uh, we didn't have the kind of fan base going into Kickstarter in, you know, into a crowdfunding campaign in the first place. And also we weren't offering extra things to hook people in to the kind of the campaign experience. Um, so I, you know, sometimes I think crowdfunders are as much to do with your ability with marketing as with the game. And I realized we're kind of weaker with marketing, um, going forward, we have a game that is kind of inspired by, uh, or has, is a nod to like a popular kind of Nintendo game. Um, but it's, it's very much its own beast. That one, you know, we may take to Kickstarter. I'm still not sure about that because again, or to a crowdfunding platform, because I'm not sure whether it, um, it will have those extra stretch goals and is it enough in itself? Um, so I guess as we go forward, I'll be looking at, does it make sense how innovative the project is? Can we do it with stretch goals, you know, and what would they be? Um, because I think I struggle a lot with the idea of like stuff and extra things. And it does sadden me a lot when I see Kickstarter campaigns that add loads of expansions, um, because, you know, quite often they don't get played. Um, they can create stress on the player when they receive it, you know, to incorporate all this stuff in, but you immediately overcomplicate the game, but I'm terrible at marketing and I've yet to find someone who can really run a Kickstarter well, I, I guess, or, you know, a crowdfunding campaign well. Yeah, for sure. Marketing is definitely crucial when it comes to crowdfunding campaigns. Though some game might not be working well with crowdfunding, especially when it comes to stretch goals with board games, it is slowly becoming the norm or more and more the norm to have stretch goals to make the game better, offer more content, the bigger the amount uh, is raised. So it's true that sometimes campaigns without stretch goals might not work as well. Like an interesting thing, I was thinking about this this morning, um, was I would love to do like uh, a holding on to, um, and can I have to kind of cover the story there? That game takes a lot of development, you know, to get ready. And I was trying to go, okay, so if I was to work out the costs, you know, to actually say, um, okay, I, I want to make this game. It's like, at what point do you go to Kickstarter with it and say it? Because do, do you put all of the work in and almost have finished product? Then it's a pre-order system kind of for the game because you invested a lot of the work in it. Um, whereas if I was to go and say, okay, this is kind of like a bit of an out there project, um, but it's gonna, cut, you know, we're gonna need at least 50, 60,000 to get this made, you know, including the artwork and, and production that then you need to get a lot of people to, to back it. So I kind of want to use crowdfunding because I want to take risks, but, but I also go, I don't know if crowdfunding is actually <laughs> the way to take those risks because of the audience that's currently using it. 
Your games are pretty light on text. You use a lot of iconography. Is this a conscious choice? What are the cons and the benefits of doing this? And what advice can you give to creators who would like to develop a language dependent or independent game? It started as a happy accident with Rory Story Cubes, where with icon, you know, the whole game was made of icons. Um, so it was essentially language free. It was very easy to produce it for different territories and you know produce different editions uh localized editions um and it also meant we could benefit from economies of scale with the factory because they could kind of mass produce some of the core components for something like the the dice it was you know it's time intensive um so they were able to kind of stockpile that and then we could just produce what was needed as orders were coming in for other territories so we kind of uh, accidentally got economies of scale with that it made it easy to sell games into other ter territories, even if they were buying um, the English language version of the game, because there's so little text, it was very easy for someone to translate it and like for the word to spread. Um, and again, this is kind of operating off of a cred funding platform um, where we're driving interest through people actually playing the game and having access to it. Because um, we always try to create the scenario, I think, where people come back to us and say, you know, we discovered your game, we want to champion it in our territory. Yeah, so the benefits are, I think you can kind of scale production and makes localization really easy and fast as well, and less prone to kind of errors. In many cases, we were able to oversee that at our end with our in-house designer. The challenges of it are sometimes you have to kind of throw things out um, because of nuance. And so uh, you, you can't really have nuance as much you know, when you're not using text on cards, there's like a happy medium because sometimes that text is kind of onerous. And so it creates a kind of laziness isn't quite the right word, but it's like, ah, sure, we'll fix it on the card. Whereas actually, if you went back and fixed it in the core mechanic of the game. So I think the, the, to me, it's always a question of like, is it really needed? You know, can you do it with less? Because the flip side is if you go into iconography and then you have to have a big reference sheet beside it then it's kind of like well <laughs> uh, for speed of play it might have been better to just put it onto the, the cards in the first place as a designer and developer you seem to look for and find different themes which are not mainstream in the board game community i think of your game old and on could you explain what the game is for the people who don't know and what were the main design struggles here and how have you solved them Holding On is a game, it's a cooperative game um, for two to four players where you're caring for a character at the end of their life. They've been rushed into your hospital and you've been tasked with looking after them um, in their final days. And you're, the goal of the game is to help the character, Billy, come to terms with the three regrets that keep him holding on. So it's a kind of a narrative, so narrative worker placement game where you're balancing between, um, so you're assigning people to cover shifts, um, discussing this between you, cover shifts and provide care for Billy. Um, you can choose between providing medical care, which will keep him alive longer um, and slow his deterioration, or you can provide palliative care, which allows you to build up trust, helps him, and helps him kind of share the story of his life and hopefully ultimately, you know, come to terms with the, regrets that he's carrying. That's essentially it. It's played over 10 scenarios with each scenario kind of pulling you deeper and deeper into Billy's kind of life and, and regrets. So it, it, it's kind of described as like, it's not entertainment and it's not necessarily fun. It's a drama based game. And we just kind of described it as, um, it's not Ali Bakfield. Uh, what is it? Um, so it was a, like a medical drama where essentially it's not really about the, the science and the medicine. It's about the people who came into the hospital every week. That's what this game is about. Um, but where it came from is um, a colleague in Slovenia who showed me an idea for a game based on Rory Story Cubes. Um, and it was about kind of a Don Quixote style game of a person kind of traveling through their imagination. And as they said that, for some reason, it, I just said, no, no, like, um, it could be about Alzheimer's um, and this idea of losing memories and 
partly uh, my mom has Alzheimer's. She's in late stage Alzheimer's now. Um, and I just thought this could be offer a really poignant experience of like watching cards flip and seeing how someone was losing access to a memory. And I was like, no one's ever done this before. And I think by my nature, I push up against the boundaries of, you know, what can be, I try to push up against boundaries of what can be done and say, hey, I'm going here. Are you interested in this? We tried to work on that idea and it was a real struggle to get something workable because it always felt like, well, you're never going to win against Alzheimer's. So it's really about how well you lose. I kind of made the decision. I wanted to make a game that would sucker punch players and, and make them feel something. That was kind of like the essence. It was like, can we make a game that would make people feel some emotion other than like, you know, anger and joy, which are the kind of, I think the easy ones to, to evoke. So yeah, I always, I think I always like to kind of push the boundaries of things. I, I have no interest in doing stuff that's already been done. It just doesn't bring me any satisfaction whatsoever. That's quite interesting to see a game like Olden On that is meant to make you feel some other type of emotions that you're not used to feeling when you're playing a board game. Crying because of a board game is quite unusual. I mean, it's not designed to make you, I don't think it's designed to make you cry. It's definitely designed to make you think and reflect. Yeah. I think that's the key thing, both on, you know, your own life, the life of the people around you, but also it gets players to play suboptimally as well because of their emotional attachment to the character. Like, and I love games where I go, logically, I know I should be doing this, but, oh, I really, you know, it's making me want to do something else. Um, I really like games that achieve that. And I think holding on does that with, you know, deciding how you should care for Billy as well. And for the last question, is there something else we haven't talked about yet and that you would like to add? There's two things I think that have always seemed to resonate with people I'm working with. One is asking that question, why should this game exist in the world? Um, you know, and it's if you can't answer it, find it. And if you can't find it, then maybe it is time to move on to something else because you're competing with so much other stuff. Answering that question gives you the fire to stick at the game because you need that fire to keep you going through the dark times. The other one then is when it comes to, I, I did a lot of work with people when they were kind of pitching their ideas to publishers. I think sometimes as designers, well, my head doesn't work that way, but we kind of operate in that kind of rules structured manner. So it's like, if someone doesn't respond to you in your email, you're like, oh, that's your fault. You're dead to me. My background is in conflict resolution. So uh, I would kind of coach people on how to kind of like phrase their email, go, hmm, you know, maybe change that wording a little bit and, you know, maybe guess at the fact that they're not, they're not lazy people, you know, they're not ignorant, they're not ignoring you. Maybe there's just a lot of stuff going on in their life right now. And the reality is your game isn't important to them. So if you think about it, like we're all busy all day and we go to the things that take our attention. It's not that we don't want to do get back to that email, but it's like out of all of the things I have to deal with, that's less important than this other thing. Your goal as a kind of designer when you're communicating is to make it as easy as possible for the person you're communicating with to say yes or no. Now there's more in terms of the conflict resolution side, but at least that person at the other end, the the relations person goes, Huh, they get me, they get that I'm really busy, <laughs> you know, and they see you as a human and you start to build trust and a relationship there. Cool. And if now people would like to work with you or they have other questions to ask you, where can they find you? I'm not massively active on social media. Um, I'm on Twitter as Rory O'Connor um, and at We Are Hub Games. Um, on Facebook, I think I'm Rory O'Connor 74. Um, and we are hub games as well. Um, Instagram as we are hub games and Rory D O'Connor. So our website is we are hub games as well. And we're in all good retail stores. Well, thank you so much. It was really nice having you here. Bye bye. And that's it for today's video on game design. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to like, comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel to follow all our crafting adventures. As well, don't forget to have a look at GameOnTabletop.com to support great crafting companies. I'll see you soon. Until then, bye-bye.